we're not singing and belting it out if you're into that now like me. But actually, you can let it wash over your heart. You, it, it can still do you good. You can still let those words kind of um, speak out and be true, even if we're not singing them. So uh, that was really cool this morning. I really enjoyed that. So thank you. Um, as Dave said, um, I'm Dan. Uh, married to Grace, got three kids who you can probably hear at different points throughout this time in the back there, making lots of noise, and that's cool as well. Um, and it's been great to kind of join in online and lovely to be able to be speaking this morning as well. We're carrying on this um, new series, uh, there you go, look at that, Faith Conversations, um, and it's my kind of privilege to share on that today. So, talking about how we can share our faith in a helpful way. Not in an unhelpful way, but in a helpful way. We all have experiences, I'm sure. Um, when I was pastoring before I was working for Open Doors, the amount of times I would bump into people and think, you are making my life as a pastor more difficult with how you're sharing your faith. Like, I'm thinking about people in the street shouting hellfire at people. You are making it more difficult for me here in the role that I have in sharing my faith. So how can we do it helpfully is what we're looking at, okay? So, um, we're looking at throwing a party. That's uh, the kind of text that I've been given, if you like. And how we've missed that kind of interaction over the last kind of year, if you like. You appreciate things all the more when we're not doing them, um, when we're not having to worry about social distancing and masks. See, I can't even tell if you're smiling or happy or not. <laughs> um, which is hard as a preacher, I think. Um, <laughs> But how can we instill this kind of culture of joy and celebration, which we associate with parties, into our culture, both as a church, but also as a Christian? In that when we're sharing our faith, we're sharing something that is a celebration, we're sharing something that is joyful and life-giving. Because I believe that everybody loves a party. Even if you're a bit socially awkward like me at parties, I'm the guy at a wedding who is most happy sat in the corner like, I don't want to be on the dance floor, that's true, isn't it? Uh, yeah. I would send anybody out if you want to dance with Grace, great. I'm going to sit in the corner, this is what I do at weddings. Um, kids' parties, I love them too. Um, in fact, I've got a little bit of a reputation for um, making other children cry at my children's birthday parties. One child, is it three years in a row or two years in a row? Two years in a row, it's still an achievement. I made the same child cry at my kids' birthday parties. Not on purpose, but just it's just what happens. But there's lots of joy uh, at these kind of events. Dinner parties, I miss doing that. I think we realised the last time we had people over was March 2020, um, just before the kind of lockdown. And how we miss kind of having people over, just in your house, enjoying one another's company. The last year, whether we're introvert or extrovert, should have shown us actually how much we miss those kind of engagements. The joy of celebrating with one another. That's why we have parties, we invite people to join in with the joy of the occasion. So I'm gonna read for you from uh, Luke, um, Luke chapter five, just before I read the passage, Luke 5, 27 to 31. Jesus has been out and about, he's been healing people. The story that precedes this is the famous story where um, there's a bunch of mates, there's a guy who's a paralytic on a mat, they can't get to Jesus because there's so many crowds and so, I mean how annoyed would you be if this was your roof, but they climb up onto the roof, take apart the roof and lower their friend down so that he can be in front of Jesus. He's then miraculously healed and in the healing, the religious leaders, which are Pharisees, Sadducees and their scribes as they're described in the New Testament, are moaning and grumbling at Jesus. So that's the context of what's going on. And then this happens. This is Luke 5, 27. After this, he went out and he saw a tax collector named Levi. That's Matthew, same guy who writes the first gospel, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at the table with them. And the Pharisees, so those religious leaders are talking about, and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So, 
Levi or Matthew, whatever you want to call him, is fine. He's a tax collector. He will be collecting taxes from the Jewish people, his own people, for the Romans. So a little bit like if we were invaded by the French, I mean, not likely, but if we were, and I decided to make my living by extracting finance from you to give to them. You probably wouldn't be too happy about it. I probably wouldn't be your friend. You'd probably hate me. That's Levi. That's the position he's in in society. He probably is a little bit bothered, a little bit self-conscious, knows he's not loved, knows he's not liked, but he's probably a wealthy fella. And so uh, when he has his dinner party, which we read about here, uh, we're told that tax collectors have visited, probably because they're his only friends, um, others that are skimming the community to. But he's invited his friends along for a dinner party. He does his work, he's sitting at a booth, and he's approached by Jesus. And I, want, I don't want to miss how remarkable this is, okay? He's just going about his work, and he's approached by Jesus. Jesus literally says to him, if you read the passage, he approaches this guy, Matthew, sitting at his tax booth, and he says to him, follow me. And Matthew, Levi's response is what's remarkable. He just gets up, leaves everything, and follows him. Now, if you compare that to other people in the New Testament, uh, when Jesus says, when you want to be my disciple, you follow me, you get people saying, I just need to deal with some family business first, and then I'll, I'll follow after you. Or, um, do I really have to give away my wealth? I'm a really good guy, Jesus, but I'm not really prepared to give away all of my money. But if, if we can compromise, then I'll follow you. You read of those accounts in the New Testament, but then you read Levi here, literally kind of one sentence, Sure, he rose and he followed him. And it got me thinking, under what circumstance would you do that? Well, the only circumstance I can kind of think of where you would do that is if something better came along. If something so amazing came before you that you were willing to drop absolutely everything for. That's pretty much the only circumstance you would do it for, I would think. And so that's what Levi does. He recognises actually, wow. There's something different about this guy. There's something worth giving up everything I know and everything I do for in order to follow after him. It's a bit like someone coming up to me and saying, Dan, we'd really love you to plant a church in the Bahamas. <laughs> I, I probably wouldn't take too long kind of praying about that. Um, well, maybe I would. Um, but it's that kind of, wow, what an opportunity. Where do I sign the paperwork? Levi realises Jesus is bringing good news, and so he just goes, okay, I'm going to follow him. And on the face of it, to us, it might seem like a rash decision to just leave everything. But when we discover Jesus and how amazing he is, there is nothing rash about it. It's the best decision that we can make in following after him. This opportunity to explore what life is truly about, to be forgiven, to have a fresh start. If you look at the end of the passage that I read, Jesus is talking about leading sinners to repentance, turning around that they follow after God. And that's precisely what Levi does. A tax collector, someone who would be notorious in the community, known as a sinner, known as someone far from God, hence the Pharisees are grumbling and moaning, finds in Jesus the opportunity for a fresh start, for forgiveness. And when we experience that for ourselves, why wouldn't we want to share it with others? Which is precisely what Levi does. Because life's been transformed by Jesus. If he's dropped everything, but he's found something that's far more valuable, why wouldn't he speak about it? Why wouldn't he invite all of his tax collector friends over for a party to meet with Jesus? It's the logical thing to do. It makes Sense. If it's the best decision of your life to follow Jesus, you want to invite other people into that celebration and into that joy. And that's what Levi does. He puts his trust in Jesus, he starts following after him, and the very next thing we read him do is he throws this party. He invites his mates over for this great feast. And it's because I believe that repentance, forgiveness, it looks like something. When we're forgiven, when we turn around, when we repent, we put our trust in Jesus, it looks like something. It should look like a change in our life. This is who I used to be, and this is who I am now. I used to host parties, and we talk about ways that we could rip off people. Now I host parties, and I invite people to meet Jesus. 
Jesus says, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I'm fairly sure that's probably your experience. Some wisdom there from Jesus, isn't there? Anyone would think he might be God um, and knows what he's talking about? You see a doctor when you're ill. I don't want to see a doctor if I'm well. No offense. <laughs> so the doctor says, yeah, I do want to see you, but not in that capacity. <laughs> And Jesus then goes on to say, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. There's a bit of a jab at the Pharisees. Actually, it's a bit of a jab at any of us who think we're right with God in our own strength. That we don't need that transformation, that we don't need him. This is the good news, even if it means admitting our own fault, isn't it? Even if it means saying, you know what, I've got that wrong, God. An amazing opportunity for every single one of us for a fresh start. That's why when we're worshipping, when we're singing, it doesn't matter that we don't sing, we can still declare it's true and he's good and he's faithful and he's for us. That word repentance literally means to turn around. It means to do a 180. It means to say, I'm not going to go my way anymore, but I'm going to go God's way. It's a radical change. And that's why um, Throwing a party, inviting people over to celebrate a joy is an effective way of reaching people and sharing your life and sharing Jesus with people. Far more effective than me just kind of bellowing at people in the street. I'm not saying that doesn't have a place, maybe it does. I'm sure there's people whose testimonies kind of actually has had an impact on their lives. I'm not saying that's not the way to do it, but I'm saying a more effective way is to walk with people is to have a relationship with people because we're calling people to a radical change. For Matthew, Levi, it was a radical change, giving up everything and following Jesus. If it's a reason to celebrate your life being transformed, what better reason to have a party than that? Now, I've been to lots of baptism services. I've had the privilege of baptizing lots of people. And baptism is this external declaration of an inward reality. It's this external declaration to the world of a celebration that God's good, that God's amazing, that God's transformed my life. I have never been to a baptism service yet that's been miserable. <laughs> They've always been celebrations. They've always been full of joy. But I don't believe that should just be for our baptism service. Actually, of all the people on this planet... If we're followers of Jesus, we should be the most optimistic, hope-filled, joy-filled people out of anybody. We should be. Now, I'm not saying life is not hard. For a living, I work for the persecuted church who get beaten up, destroyed, smashed to pieces for following Jesus. They are the most joyful people I've ever met. So it's not about our circumstance. It's about our relationship with God. And so... We should have this joy and this celebration in knowing who God is, and we should want to invite people into that. We should want to invite our city, our towns, our friends, our neighbours, our work colleagues into that. And a great way of doing that, as Levi does, is by having a party. I want to tell you a story, actually, of a lady called Amanda. It's quite obviously not her real name. She's a Muslim lady from northern China. Um, she's not called Amanda. <laughs> Um, was to protect her identity. But just to kind of reflect this kind of repentance looks like something. It's something practical, but it's something joy-filled and celebratory. Her and her husband, who live in the northernmost part of China, um, Muslim area of China, which we don't necessarily think of, I guess, in our kind of normal understanding of, of that country. Um, but her day job is as a fortune teller. That's what she does. And she was so good at predicting the future and telling people their hopes and dreams that people would travel to her house and she would host parties where she would share these kind of, this is what's going to happen, this is what is going on. And so people would travel for miles and miles and miles to be with Amanda. She was popular. She was well known for what she would do. But even as a fortune teller, she didn't see this coming. One night, she got ill. Funny that, isn't it? Like, not for me, she got ill, but for me, she didn't see it coming. Um, so... She got ill. She woke up in the morning, she couldn't move. Completely paralysed out of nowhere. So rushed to hospital with her husband. In hospital, test after test after test, nobody can find out what's going on. Nobody knows what's happened. Doesn't seem to be a cure. Doesn't seem to be a way forward. Now Amanda's sister is Christian. 
had been witnessing through relationship to Amanda for many, many, many years. To no avail. He'd given her a Bible to no avail. But she'd just been dropping in these things time after time after time. She hadn't given up on her sister. So she visits her sister in hospital. She shares again about the hope and joy she has in Jesus. Jesus is the only saviour for all mankind. And then on that night, Amanda has a dream. I'm just going to read <laughs> this dream out to you. These are her words. It says this. I had a dream. I was in a taxi and it was very dark outside. We were driving into complete darkness when suddenly three men wearing white robes with radiant lights all around them appeared on the right hand side of my car. I couldn't see their faces, but they told me it was time for me to make a choice. As quickly as they had appeared, they disappeared. Then two men wearing black robes appeared to the left of the taxi. They approached me and tried to entice me to join them on their side of the car. Something drew me inexplicably to the white robes. So I got out on the right hand side of the taxi. I woke from the dream and I knew immediately that one of the men in white was Jesus and that I had to follow him. I prayed right there in my bed, gave my life to Jesus and immediately the paralysis left my body. It has never returned. She continues, incredibly, my husband, had a similar dream six months later. He woke me in the middle of the night with the same revelation. So we prayed again together to surrender our lives to Jesus. It's a remarkable story of Jesus breaking in, but there's a wider point here of what Amanda goes on to do. Repentance looks like something. So she was a fortune teller, and she would attract a lot of attention from people coming to her house, and she'd throw parties. Guess what she does now? She throws lots of parties, but instead of trying to tell them their future, she tells people about Jesus. Now in northern China, that's very dangerous. She's been disowned by her own family. She's been rejected. Her own children have been beaten because of her faith. And yet she continues to throw a party. She continues to be characterized by joy and celebration. And people have been coming to faith. For her, what's more important is, I'm going to introduce people to Jesus. And I'm going to use relationships that I once had, where I maybe told them their future, to now tell them about something even better. They can see a marked change in her life. Because, even though she was journeying with them in fortune telling, she's now journeying with them with Jesus. She's gotten to know them on a personal level. So I just want to throw out, really quickly, a few kind of practical applications for us on how maybe like Levi or maybe like Amanda we can show hospitality we can, you, we can share our faith we can use what we have to share our faith in a way that is helpful for us in our witness but actually helpful for other people in encountering Jesus the first one is this that I believe relationship is king in as much as it's the most important thing to kind of cultivate and develop we're not parachuting in and parachuting out of people's lives. Oh, I'm going to parachute in, but if I don't get anywhere, I'm parachuting out again. No, we walk with people. We journey with people. There's this great story, isn't there, in, later in Luke, actually, uh, where Jesus is walking along the road to Emmaus. He's, he's died and he's come back to life. And there's these two kind of like characterized kind of really low, head to the ground, followers of Jesus. They're like, oh. It's terrible what happened in Jerusalem. Jesus is gone. Life is miserable. Let's give up. And Jesus doesn't reveal who he is to them, but he walks along this road with them. And then he goes for dinner with them. And then he reveals himself to them. It would have been really easy at the start of that for Jesus to just go, guys, stop you right there. Let me tell you exactly who I am. Instead, he tells the whole story. He goes from the beginning all the way through so that they would see that he is Jesus when they eat together. He journeys with them. He walks with them. And I love that. I love that Jesus does that. And I think, well, that's a model there, isn't there? He's interested in them as people. He journeys with them. He doesn't drop in and drop out. A few years ago, I had uh, the immense privilege of leading a friend of mine, in fact, I'm going to see them later today, uh, a friend of mine to faith. And he described it to me over these kind of many months of um, coming to faith in Jesus as, Bit by bit, piece by piece, it was just falling into place. It wasn't like an instant, like bang. It was little by little, through relationship, 
through conversations. And it wasn't just faith conversations, there were lots of faith conversations till 2 a.m. in the morning. Those things happened, you know, when we were allowed in each other's houses. But it was also talking about the football. It was also going on a walk together, hanging out, our families kind of hanging out together. It wasn't this one kind of trick pony moment. And I think when it comes to sharing our faith and throwing a party, we need to avoid the two extremes. The one extreme of all I ever do is talk about faith to a point where actually you don't get to know me as a person. Now, yes, my faith is part of who I am, a huge part of who I am. It, it changes my whole worldview and how I look at that. But actually, I'm also a, a Liverpool football club fan for my sins. I also love sport. <laughs> I also occasionally like going on a walk. I love my family, I love my kids. I like to travel. I like what I do for a living. I like to talk about work and the persecuted shit. Like, there's stuff to us, isn't there, as people? We have to invite people into our lives so they get to know us. They get to know my vulnerabilities, my weaknesses, my strengths, what worries me, how they can support me too. That's what a relationship looks like, right? And a huge part of that is our faith. But if all I ever talk about is, and all I'm ever doing is talking and not listening, it's like that I'm not actually going to get anywhere with that person. So that's one extreme. The opposite extreme is we don't talk about it at all. I had a guy in my last church worked in uh, his workplace for 25 years and nobody knew he was a Christian. And I said to him, I said, do you know that's a bit of a problem? He went, yeah, probably. One <laughs> year? 25 years. They should know that you're a follower of Jesus. Not because, you know, every Monday morning you, you're standing in front of your colleagues and you say, just want you to all know I'm a Christian. Thanks very much, and that's all you have to say. <laughs> but because of the way that you act, what you do, how it informs your life, not just what we say, but what we do. They're the two extremes. I feel like there's gotta be a happy medium, somewhere in between. And a great way of doing that, I think, is to invite people into our lives, into our homes, by throwing things like parties. Not with like, I've got a secret agenda here that if I invite you in at night. You know, we share some food, you have a bottle of wine, and I'm going to hit you with the gospel. <laughs> like, to get to know people. To provide the opportunity for those faith conversations. That you don't have to force it, but they come naturally. Because you're creating the space for them. That's why this next kind of thing I want to say as a tip is so important. is Open up your home if you have one. You know, if you're lodging in someone else's home, maybe don't, you know, maybe I'll just <laughs> But like, if you've got your own home, open up your home to strangers, to enemies, to the work colleague who does your nuts in. Because there is always one, and if there isn't one, you're probably that work colleague. <laughs> it's sacrificial. That's what hospitality is. Sacrificial on our part for the benefit of other people. So that people will see Christ within you. We can be, I think, windows, pointers towards Jesus through relationships so that people see Christ. We have to provide the opportunity to give shape for people to see that, crafting out the time in our diaries to make space for that. Because I think we can, yes, we can talk about Jesus at the school gates, we can talk about Jesus, uh, you know, with our work colleague and kind of a five minute break, whatever it might be. But to give that rounded, bigger picture, we need to create time. We need to give time for relationship, to get to know people. People aren't projects. People are people who are loved by God. And if we're a follower of Jesus, we have uh, our mission, if you like, if, if God has transformed our lives, if he's the best decision ever, if we experience what Levi experienced, then we want to introduce people to God, right? If he's been so good for us, then the least we can do is to introduce others to him. If he's transformed my life, I want him to transform the life of my friends. And so it's in both word and deed opening up our life by creating those opportunities to invite people in. And I want to say this isn't about arguments, this isn't about rights or wrongs, which often it can kind of descend into. It's about people. And those people knowing whether you care about them or not. 
have always maintained that if someone can be argued into the kingdom by my persuasive argument, there is somebody with a more persuasive argument, who is more eloquent than I, who can argue them out. It's not about having an argument. It's not about even having all the answers. I've been a Christian now for, I was thinking about this this morning, uh, I was baptised at 16, um, but let's say, I'm approaching 20 years there or thereabouts of following after Jesus. I don't have all the answers. When you talk to a non-Christian, actually, that can be a bit surprising. I remember with my friend who I led to faith, he was like, what? You're the pastor. How do you not have all the answers? Well, I don't have the answers. I'm not Jesus. I can try, but I don't have them. It's about journeying with someone, exploring faith with them together. There is a place for apologetics. There is a place for uh, giving a defence for our faith. And I'd be more than happy to do that. And there's a context and a place for that. But with your average friend, who you want to invest and have a relationship with, talk about Jesus. Sure, you can talk about the end times, and you can talk about Genesis 1, 2, and 3, all the way up to 50. So you can do that until the cows come home. But talk about Jesus. And if, you know, you're kind of like, well, I don't really know what to say. Well, they might say, well, I believe this. Okay, well, why do you believe it? Asking the why question is crucial. Because then we start to explore different things. It's not just something theoretical, it's something that means something in their heart. If we're just about winning arguments, we will lose people. You might win arguments, but you'll lose people. It's about walking with them, inviting them into your world. And I want to say this as a kind of final thought. For those of you who have shared your faith in the past, or maybe you've thrown some parties and they've not, they've not gone well. <laughs> Whatever it might be. Or you've been invited to parties and you're thinking, oh, I don't want to go to one like that again. Don't let bad experiences write you off from going again. To be a disciple of Jesus is to what? If you read the New Testament, what does Jesus do? He gets this rabble of blokes around him and then a wider group of people and then the start of the first church. And what does he do? He sends them out. What does he send them out to do? To be good news. To share the life-transforming message of Jesus. So you want to, oh, I want to grow my discipleship. Start sharing your faith. I want to do mission. Start sharing your faith. Start inviting people into your world. That's what it means to follow Jesus. That's where our faith actually begins to grow because it is uncomfortable. Because it can feel awkward. Because it's not always easy. Because sometimes we have bad experiences. And sometimes people reject us. But you know what? There's also people who won't. There's people just waiting to hear about Jesus. There's people going, oh, what is life all about? I've been searching in all the wrong places. And then, wow, it starts to make sense when someone talks about Jesus. My friend who uh, I led to faith, he used to say this to me, he says, and this was the mark of the transformation. I always find this funny, he says, Spotify doesn't know what to recommend to me anymore. <laughs> Everything's changed. <laughs> I'm not who I used to be. It's the best decision of my life. So I want to challenge you as we kind of go from here today. I know that COVID kind of limits parties. <laughs> but maybe start looking ahead going, okay, in theory, from May, from June, things start opening up a little bit more. Start crafting some space in your diary. I'm going to leave this evening free so I can invite people over. I'm going to go to the pub because I can, and I can sit outside in a freezing cold. I can do that right now, but I'm going to craft the time to do that. So that people get to know me. And if they get to know me, they get to know my Jesus. Because he's a huge part of my life. I want to challenge you to start crafting out the space to do that. And take a risk. Start talking about Jesus. I think we'll be very surprised at how that goes. Because if he really is the best thing, worth giving up everything for, which I believe he is, as Levi did, and we've got this good news, and surely it's worth sharing that news. It has to be. I'm going to pray for us, and then hand back to death.